For common friends, um, the title of Susie's talk begins with not yet. So we were laughing. There's a sense of irony that um, that was kind of my mood yesterday morning when Susie contacted me and said, I am stuck at the airport and the plane has a flat tire. So uh, her talk last night was not yet. So, um, but we dropped you off next door at 1.30 a.m. and you're just bright and cheery today and ready to go for the weekend. So last year I contacted Susie about doing a two-day workshop here at the Kirk Newman Art School. Um, I've long admired Susie's Pots and knew she had so much to offer to our clay community and ceramic students. And as a potter, I personally admire anyone that can talk endlessly about pots. It's what we do. Um, the other thing I have recognized obviously is that we talk about six degrees of separation and in the pottery world there's usually one or two degrees of separation so we stayed awake at you know driving back and like oh you know this person you know this person well i worked with him and i wood fired with him so this has been really great and it just feels like having family here having susie here so um as you'll see susie's pots have an energy and expression and personality all on, while inviting warmth and use to any table i had the pleasure of visiting susie's studio in the mountains of Western North Carolina about 19 years ago. She was away teaching, however, her husband Kent was very gracious and allowed me to walk around their studio while he was busy trimming pots. Susie received her clay training with a fellowship at Penland School of Craft and com after completing her MFA at Louisiana State University, she returned to Penland as an artist in residence and eventually established Fork Mountain Pottery with her husband and fellow potter Kent McLaughlin. In her 35 years plus of making pots, Susie has visibly been influenced by pots from a thousand years ago, from all corners of the globe, to her contemporaries, her friends, and her own collection. She has said, I make things to entice the user to take pleasure in everyday activities, inviting participation, promoting hospitality. Please show your Kalamazoo hospitality and welcome Susie Lindsay. Uh, thanks so much for coming back today. I'm sorry I wasn't here last night. Um, I uh, <clears throat> I'm really thrilled to be here, and um, I'm looking forward to working with everybody this weekend. So um, my clay education started at a craft school um, 37 years ago at Penland School of Crafts, and this is an aerial shot of the Pines, which is one of the buildings there. It's in Western North Carolina, where I live now. It's just it's uh, 15 miles from my home. Um, this place introduced me to the many approaches of, to working with clay and helped me solidify my foundation for making functional work. Um, it was pivotal in developing my skill and knowledge as a craftsperson and helping me realize that making meaningful objects and helping me realize that to make meaningful objects connects me to people. Um, Penland offers seasonal workshops. And um, so they run workshops one and two weeks long in the summertime and then um, eight week long concentrations in the fall and the spring. Forward. Um, the nice thing too is that the studios are open 24 seven. So when you go there and take workshops uh, that you can just go in and out of the studios. And there's, it's a contemporary craft school. It has glass, wood, paper making, print making, photography, um, at, you know, just has all the crafts. And so, um, and usually in the summertime, there's about 200 students there. Um, when I first went to Penland, I was a hobby potter um, and I was teaching school full time. Oh, where'd the slide go? Uh oh. Oh, there it is. Is that up there? Okay. All right. <laughs> when I first went to Penland, I was a hobby potter. So I was, um, uh, my undergraduate degree is in education. Um, I was working with hearing impaired children in Louisiana. Um, and I, then I also did a Montessori training. So I have an education background, but because I was a teacher, I was able to take my summers off and go up and take workshops at Penland. And um, my first teacher uh, thought I, it was about three years till I learned how to center. <laughs> right? 
So once I kind of got beyond that point, she said, you should go to Penland. I thought I was really good. And I went up there and it blew my mind. Like I had no idea. And I realized how hard, and I think the very first workshop, that workshop instructor said, I said, I want to be a studio potter. And she said, you should keep your day job. Wow. Yeah, she was right. Um, so I quit my job uh, uh, after being a Penland when I was accepted into their core fellow program. It's a program where you work for the school in exchange for room board and tuition. It's a two year long program. So you are exposed you know, so I really centered my classes on um, working on potters, but I could have gone to any of the studios as a core fellow and take, taken classes, but I was concentrating because my skill level still wasn't that well developed and I had all these ideas that I couldn't execute. I'm getting used to this computer. Um, so these were the first pots I made after that first concentration class that I was a core fellow. Um, I had lots of ideas about making functional work, but I just did not have the ability to execute those ideas. So for this talk, because it's called Not Yet, I am going to talk, I'm going to show pots that I've worked on, on the left hand side, and that, that were older, and pots that I'm working on now that still have the same idea. So, um, let me kind of get through this, I don't, my next slide. So. Um, at Penland, I was ex exposed to all kinds of makers, and there was so much that I wanted to explore. Um, I was learning about atmospheric firings, and I was passionate about wood firing. Um, I was interested in mark making on the surface and figuring out how to enhance the forms. And also at this point, I was introduced to Bernard Leach's ideas of functional pots being beautiful objects in your everyday life. Um, and I also saw the leech wheel. Um, and, and so that's what I throw on now. So I was introduced to that idea. Um, mostly working with soft clay on a really slow wheel, it just makes your whole process kind of slow down and breathe. Um, those of us that throw on treadle wheels call it the cult of the slow wheel. Um, so, you know, slow rotation, soft clay, it just slows down the, the pace of making. Um, after those two years at Penland, I went to graduate school. Um, it was kind of intimidating. I didn't have an undergraduate degree in art. Um, but, and I also think as a potter, many times when you go off to an art school, you really have to defend why you're making functional wear. So this is my thesis show, and I didn't want to show on pedestals. I wanted to show how I lived with pots, how I envisioned people living with pots. Um, and so I had a dining table, I had a kitchen sink, I had a hutch, I had an entryway table. So I just had this one image, but that was the idea from, for this show. Um, I knew I would benefit from art history. I took classes in printmaking and drawing. And um, it was just a really another valuable, I mean, I think anytime that you can go anywhere and take a class is such a gift to yourself. Um, so I really, uh, and I was also just trying to talk to a lot of my professors about how, um, pottery can enhance your everyday life. Um, I feel really lucky to have had my clay education at Penland and at LSU. There are two really different approaches to teaching and learning. Penland's a craft school. It's mostly a how-to, a technique. It's, 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 it's kind of how we teach clay in, in many places. And when I went to graduate school, they just kept asking me, why? Why are you making that? What are you making? Why, 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 why? And I had to figure that out too. So, um, and I'm still figuring it out. It's, it's the whole not yet thing, right? Like, why am I doing this? Um, both required me to dig deep. Um, and I had to work on my skill development and forma formation of personalized ideas of the pots that I wanted to make. Um, so in 1993, I moved back to Penland to be an artist in residence at the Barnes, and that's at the Barnes uh, Studios at the school. Um, it houses seven uh, new young artists that are interested in creating um, a life-selling work. 
Um, you know, um, at least at that time when I was there, it wasn't, they were really trying to make people that, uh, get people in there that were studio art, wanted to be studio artists rather than as a stepping stone into um, teaching in, a, in an MFA program. So um, this started and informed my career path as a working studio potter. Um, it was three years. Um, you, it subsidized, Penland subsidized the rent for the housing in the studio, but you have to come with all your equipment. So when you leave there, your, all your equipment goes with you. So it's a pretty amazing program to, to help people get set up that want to be and have their own studios. Um, helpful and supportive and working towards working studio artists. Um, and also I was figuring out how to make a living. There were many of us that would go out to show, you know, there, there, it was mixed, so there was glass, clay, wood, sculpture, there was who, depending on bookmaking. Um, and people, those of us that were residents at that time would go out and do shows and then come back and say, this might be a good show for you to do. You, you, know, you should try this or, yeah. So, um, so, and then after that three years, my husband and I moved 15 miles from the school and built our studio. And that's the bottom right. So that's my throwing room right there. That's the, in the, in the yeah, pretty nice. Um, in the showroom, um, I, there's display. There's we have a little gallery space. It started out um, pretty low tech and was just some shelving in the barn. Uh, but as we um, as we got money, we built and added onto the studio. So now there's a formal showroom at the at the house in the studio. And um, this is the old booth that I used to take to craft fairs. But we we built it with the idea of like representing tabletops and bookshelves and the way that we live with pots again. So um, for me, uh, working in clay has been about persistence. Um, I like to redefine an old idea and ponder what might come next. And I'm always keeping myself in the parameters of function. It's really important to me that they work. So, um, and they, this, these next series of slides are two shots. The pot on the left are the beginning and the older ideas and the more current work is on the right. Um, these canisters on the top left were some of the first slides that I ever took. It's what I applied to be a scholarship student at Penland with. There's the black velvet in the back. You know, the, there's that Ruccio glaze. Yeah, and, um, but, and the, but I'm still making canister sets. And so the, that bottom right shot is, um, is a couple years old of some canister sets. Um, I just feel uh, that you have to have patience and endurance to follow through with the work. Um, I first started making coffee pots with pour overs in grad school. I wasn't, I'm not a tea drinker, I'm a coffee drinker. So I was pretty interested. I was also camping a lot then too. So I was using uh, pour overs uh, camper style. So on the top left is a shot from grad school, the breakfast set for two. Um, I know that coffee pots definitely influence people's lives because you got to slow down to use them when you got to pour the water through. Like when all these pots started coming out that you just, we all have them now, right? You just program, I don't use them, but you program them and then they turn on for you. But this definitely makes you slow down in the morning. And then on the right is a, is a, more, is a more recent coffee pot. Um, and, and you can kind of see the forms are changing. I'll talk a little bit about more of that, that um, as we go through the slideshow. Um, I'm one spiring in the salt kiln. So this clay body is part of my palette. So the brown that you see is my clay body that's exposed. So those of you that are taking the workshop will be doing some slip decoration and you, know, you can kind of see how I'm applying slips. Um, these pots have a copper glaze over the top of the slips. So I'm also doing that, but we won't get to the glazing you guys are going to be bisking. Um, one thing that I want my pots to speak about is volume and generosity. Um, being open, being open and able to give and receive its contents. Um, on the top left, um, I call those the May West vases. They're kind of large and loud and funny. Um, and uh, I think one of the ways that I stay active in the studio is that I like to problem solve. So 
But those vases, they are very much splayed open on the top. And I was interested in carrying that surface from the outside back into the inside. Um, I'm using brushwork and paper resist for motif and mark making. Um, and I'm also, you know, when I'm making sets like this, I'm considering how to make sets work together. Um, so with the throwing and altering of pots, I get to play and anthropomorphize. So, um, you know, it's very common for us to think about pots with lips and shoulders and feet. And so I just was like, I'm going to take that literally. And I'm going to start thinking about my pots that way, literally. So the bikini pot uh, was in grad school and I got in trouble for it because it was so literal. I got criticized. But I also knew that one of the ways that I was thinking about the pots was that I was going to be dressing them. I was going to make these forms. They were going to have really exaggerated hips and waists that I was going to accentuate with my mark making. And, and so many times I'm thinking about dressing them. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more abstracted as I work, which I like. Um, but I also really, you know, I think uh, after grad school, I went to the Met and saw a Picasso show, and he had a bikini pot. And I was just like, aha! <laughs> <laughs> Great minds think alike. So um, uh, let's see. So I'm also really responding to the form after I've thrown it. So um, I, because I'm once firing, I when things are leather hard, that's when I get to decorate. So that I'm not going through this like bisking, and then all of a sudden you have to come. It has to come back to me, and I have to think about how I'm going to glaze it. I'm responding right there. I think that's really nice about the immediacy of working like that. The hard part is uh, that it slows you down. You know, you, you don't make the pot and put it over there to bisque. It's, it, you, it, it's really in demand for until you get it finished and get it back up on the shelf. Um, so this weekend, um, if you're in the workshop, we're gonna be working on stacking forms. Um, I make these little components and um, in the past on the top left, um, I was throwing all of them and stacking them. And on the, uh, but now I'm hand building pod forms and, um, and, and putting them with thrown elements and then stacking them together. Um, many times I'm playing, I, I throw a board of different heights of things, cones and balls, and then I just play in the studio. So that's another great way to kind of keep your interest in the studio. I, I am, I'm, building the form, I'm creating the form as I'm building it. So I'm playing around with the proportions. Um, it's this kind of thing called don't know, we'll see. Not yet. Um, it's that type of approach. If you all know who Karen Carnes is, was, she was a potter at Black Mountain College. Um, when Black Mountain College was very well known, when all the, um, when Annie Albers and uh, when, when Black Mountain College was a big, art place, but she was the potter there. And she has a great film called Don't Know, We'll See. Oops, what happened there? Something moved. Okay. Um, so I'm playing with different scales and proportions. Um, the components are hand-built and thrown. I'm playing with symmetry. Um, I'm assembling different parts for new forms. And I'm also, for these pots, I'm looking at cycladic figurines. So I'm looking at historical work um, and being inspired by those. These are, the, here's some more stacking on the top left. There's um, those, I'm, I, I'm a gardener. Uh, and so I'm really, and I make a lot of bases. So I make a lot of vertical forms. And these, and so then I started thinking about making them very specifically for the type of flowers that they're for. So those, those are for gladiola. They're pretty tall. Um, and, but then on the right, that's a pair of candlesticks for the mantle. Um, they're different forms, but I'm really interested in how I can pull to, them together as a pair. So I think of them as like little couples. Uh, you know, and even the mark making really isn't the same on those. I could have chosen to do the same marks, but I was just interested to see if, to see what would happen, if they could be together and be different. 
just like couples. Um, and I'm also really interested in the negative space that happens when they sit together. So there's, um, I did a lot of craft fairs in, early in my career. And um, I don't know if you know about booth face, but it's this, this kind of glazed look that you get when you're just sitting in there all day long and nobody comes into your booth. Uh, so I, there was a lot of times that I was just sitting and staring at my pods. And that's why I was like, oh, look at that interesting negative space. <laughs> So um, platters and serving dishes um, are giving me a canvas for flatter surface for brushwork. Uh, um, and as Julie said, I look at a lot of historical work. Um, anytime I'm anywhere, I go to museums in these cities. I live very rurally. Um, so um, I love going to museums. But these, the pot on the, the fan tray on the bottom right is based on Japanese Aribe ware from 16th century. Really beautiful pots, I just love them. Um, and I think the thing about looking at historical work is that um, I like to decipher why I'm responding to it. Um, what is it that I like? What would I take away? Um, and for my mark making, I'm also looking at a lot of patterns in nature. So um, I try to, uh, organize and then kind of abstract imagery. And I'm looking at a lot of positive and negative spaces and trying to uh, follow the geography of the pot. <clears throat> um, the one way that I problem solve too about what I'm gonna make is to consider how and where the pots are used. So are they daily use? Um, are they on the kitchen and the countertop? Are they on the table? Or are they for a ritual? Are they made for a special occasion? So um, this is kind of how I started getting into making the candelabra. So as I was thinking about um, more you know, specialized, well, really, I made the first ones for Kent. So they were, but um, they, they're just part of my vernacular now. And I just really love making these. These are all, these are handled from slabs. I think we're going to do some of this this weekend, too. Um, and then also with these, I make them in sets and pairs. And I think about the relationships between the two pieces. Um, with these two, the pairs are pulled together by the common surface. Um, and I'm looking at this conversation that they're having between each other with the negative space. And I'm problem solving about how to make them a pair. I mean, obviously, with these, with these sets, um, I did the surface the same but I'm also still responding to the form about where I'm placing those marks. And I'll be talking about that this weekend too. <clears throat> More vases, these older ones on the left are uh, thrown and stacked. You know, for those of us, um, I, I was talking about how I was not a competent thrower for a really long time. So the one of the ways that I was able to get go vertical was to make forms and stack them together to get some height on things and, also, and not to have them weigh a ton. Um, so um, those were just made by altering and throwing and I'm still making pretty bases that have long necks, but now they are these pieces that are on the right. Um, and that's a little, that's a hand-built pod, added feet and a long neck. I like to say that, you know, my pots, are starting to look more like me. <laughs> so, you know, now everything's going this way. <laughs> so I, I'm really interested in these forms that are for taller bouquets. And um, these little uh, footed bud bases um, were made when I taught at Haystack in 1997. Um, I really love teaching. It's, it's something um, because I was a because I taught kids, I feel uh, really pretty comfortable with it. But I also, coming out of the studio to teach, it, I always do the assignments that I give the students because then I get something out of it. It's usually something that I'm, I'm thinking about and I don't get a chance to do because I'm in the production side of the studio. Um, so it's great for me to experiment and try out new things. It's also gonna be great for you to see me fail. I mean, I, you know, there's so much failure in what we do. Um, 
So on the top left were the very beginnings of these little vases. And I just, it was um, an assignment where you had to work from a body and add different necks and feet. And you can kind of see how those now have not yet, right? They weren't ready yet. And there's, I'm still working on them, but they've just, they're, they're just much more elegant with the longer feet. There's just, a, you know, I just have a bigger skill set now too. And I've also figured out how I want them to look. Um, let's see if I... You know, the other one idea feeds the next. Um, that's another way that I problem solve. It's like, what did I learn from making that? What's feeding me for the next idea? I am playing around with different elements to make new forms. Um, I'm hand building pods and parts, and I'm also throwing parts, and then I'm assembling them all. So with these two forms on the top left, that's an older one. That's just, there's a, there was an oval pod that I make because I'm gonna show you this weekend. And, um, uh, and then I just thought, okay, this is taking me too much time to hand build this. I'm gonna throw that. So the pot on the right are some of the newer vases that I'm throwing, I'm throwing an enclosed form and then adding, to, adding feet and necks to it. It's not any faster. <laughs> um, I also work off the wheel um, and hand build these forms with slabs. Um, and I can probably attribute that to when I was a core fellow at Penland, I took a workshop with Akio Takamori. He, he was the first person that I ever saw draw on paper, take the paper to the clay slab and then transfer that imagery onto the clay slab and then work the clay slab, work the volume into a clay slab. So that's how I would make candelabras and make these forms. It's different, but it's the same. He was the first person that I ever saw that. And I was, I was just like, I am never taking a hand building class. I am a thrower. Take a hand building class. You just need all those skills. It's just so wonderful. Um, so uh, the right on the right is from grad school. Um, it was in the very beginning. I was working in porcelain and black slip. I was trying to really pare it down to see what forms I could make and how I would, and I really wanted the mark making to respond to the form and enhance the form. So I just thought if I pared it way down to black and white, I was gonna get some more information. So those were kind of, and I was still thinking about the body. So these are, they were kind of torso influenced. Um, but now I use that slab technique for these bird vases. Um, and um, I, I just, you, it's kind of like a, a pattern. So it's like a dress pattern. You make a, an A and a B side, and then you work volume into it, and then you put them together when they're leather hard. Um, I've been traveling to South America, um, and I've been studying a lot of pre-Columbian pots, um, specifically from uh, early Chilean and, um, and Andean cultures. Um, and so I came home and was trying to make some llamas. <laughs> uh, so I'm still working on those forms, but um, I've been making these bird bases for a while now. And here's some more birds. Um, uh, on the top left are candlesticks. Um, and the uh, bottom right is our ewers. You know, and I kind of saw the, the bird the, the bird form in a ewer that when I was in Italy one time, they make these really beautiful, I can't remember what the culture is, I should, but um, I came home and was like, I'm gonna make those. Um, so I'm making the pieces, I'm glazing them when they're, decor when they're leather hard, I decorate the outside when they're leather hard, and um, my palette is just very, very limited. I just, um, I have a, a black a flashing slip and a porcelain slip and a green glaze and that's about, that's about what I'm dealing with. So, um, but I'm dealing with a lot of mark making and I'm really interested in building up a surface underneath a surface so that it has some depth. So um, the slips help me do that. Um, I'm, I make dinnerware. Um, the, on the top right are thrown plates. Um, I love to lay them all out and approach each peach individually for the surface. Um, usually if I get a plate order, I usually tell them I'm, I'm going to decorate them all different. Is that okay? I'll keep them in the, you know, I'll either keep them in the same palette, but the surface, or, or, you know, there's been a couple people that have said, you know, I want the same thing. They picked out the design and then I made them. 
Um, I'm now also hand building square plates. So I make a lot of place settings um, and these are slab built on the top right. Uh, everything but the, the mug is made from a slab. Um, and my most recent work is also slab built and pinched. And it's back to referencing those Japanese Oribe wear forms for a form and surface. Uh, and back to that same idea about um, problem solving for making the forms for, by, for where they're use, used. Um, on the top right, those are just regular cereal bowls. And on the bottom, oh, I mean, I'm sorry, top left is this, are cereal bowls. And on the bottom right is serving bowls. So, uh, you know, I made round pots. Um, I tried, when I was at Penland, I tried to work with all the leech potters that came through that were teaching. Um, and at that point, the, most of them were throwing and altering. And so um, I was really thinking, so I learned that from them. Um, so these are altered forms that I make. They're thrown without bottoms. They're taken out of the round, off the wheel. Um, and on the top right, is uh, that's darted. Um, on the very top, but it, you know, when you dart things, and, and I'll be doing that this weekend too, you, it constricts everything. So um, it just wasn't as functional as I wanted it to be. I was like, okay, and now I'm making Kleenex box holders. <laughs> Once it kind of came out, it was really good. So I make those forms now without darting them in there. And there's one in the showcase out here that, and then I call them asparagus dishes because that's what I serve my asparagus in. So, and then on the bottom, and then that, that base on the right is um, more of a spoon. You know, when, the, when we had the last economy crash, Kent and I were trying to make things that were under $50. And then I came up with these spoon holders. So um, I, I'm, they're still a part of my repertoire now because people, you know, I'm really interested in making things that people can use every day. Um, the teapots are made with hand-built components that I call pods. Um, and the pods can be various shapes. So they're diamonds and squares and triangles and ovals. And um, I can play around with the orientation of that pod. So on the left, that pod is vertical. But on the right, that pod is horizontal. Do you see where I'm, the pods that I'm talking about? They're the main body of the thing. No, they're not the neck or the feet or the spout. They're just the main body of that. Um, so I can play around with the assembly. The, the, the ones that are vertical, four legs to make a vertical form stand like that, I would just, I just, it's so frustrating. I've stopped making those forms because I just was like, if I'm not enjoying it, I'm not gonna make it. So I've stopped making, but, I, but the resolution was to put, make them horizontal. It's so much easier to get the legs on them when they're, when they're horizontal. Um, and going back to that idea about how ideas develop, these are some oval bases um, that are thrown without a bottom and taken out of the round. But then um, I expanded that idea to kind of make them oval, but have them be bookend bases and have them be different scales. Um, I make a lot of serving pieces. I'm from a family that loves to cook. And so we prepare and present um, lots of food for a buffet or a table. Although um, my kids were just, just toasted Thanksgiving and they had things in those metal pans. <laughs> I was about ready to kill them. <laughs> anyway, here's the home, my home and studio. Um, it's 10 miles from the Appalachian Trail. Um, it's in Western North Carolina. Um, and I've been working there since 1996. So um, now this is more current work and I was just gonna read this article that I wrote um, called Not Yet and I'll just kind of go through some slides. Um, when listening to a TED talk in the studio the other day, I heard an educational specialist speak about the aspects of reward or retribution when grading student work describing the effects of accolades and achievement when receiving an A and de degradation when, when graded below average. 
The speaker proposed that if this grading strategy could change and, and a simple not yet is delivered to the student, then everyone experiences success. Not yet, and implies that there is still more work to be done. There is no deficiency and the student can experience some sense of accomplishment being unburdened moving forward with his or her own, his or her own work. Not yet. This really struck a chord with me. In my own studio practice and as a workshop leader, I have taken note and applied this to my thinking. I was supposed to change the slide, I forgot. <laughs> okay. um, personally, I have been challenged by the investigation of clay form and its meaning. In my early days of potting, I struggled with skill levels and the technical aspects of making. I had so many ideas, but not the, the, the ability to execute the idea. Sketchbook and writing became a way to record ideas for the future and develop my personal vocabulary, which helps me with my anal analytical processes, thus helping my work to grow. Paul Sparenson calls the sketchbook his portable studio. We can take it anywhere and record anything since it's our own personal journal. As I continue to look through old sketchbooks, I notice my own not yet, and it supports me in moving forward and redefining an old idea and pondering what might be implied by the piece. Not yet. <clears throat> when, when teaching, I've discovered that many of us struggle to describe what we wanted our work to what want our work to be. To make good pots, not only do we have to be incredibly proficient in our craftsmanship, we also have to address our intentions. Is it an object of service? Is it an object of contemplation? How do we develop that vocabulary? One quote I love is from John Cage who stated, don't try to create and analyze at the same time. They are different processes. And I believe this to be true. I love to sit at the wheel and respond to this amazing material called clay. When thinking about the Cage quote, I can break my processes into two parts. Form, the way, the way in which a thing is made, and meaning, the purpose for which a thing is made. I found it extremely helpful to do writing exercises that describe what is wanted from the work. I have experienced success with this practice into the, take, by taking this practice into the classroom short, with short writing exercises for students, the objective being that each one acquires his or her own words. These words can bring some revelations and assist us in creating a body of work that is personal and meaningful to the maker. Students learn what to praise, what to polish, and hopefully give themselves some space and time to get the results they want. Not yet. So how lucky we are to attend conferences and workshops like this, to meet each other, to find a community, a tribe, to talk about problems and resolutions, to stimulate ideas and keep our creative fires burning. We get to watch our peers and our teachers handle clays in ways that spark our imagination, inspiring a new way of thinking and approaching our own work. We appreciate what we appreciate that we can take this experience home, interpret it in a way we enjoy working, innovate, and start to apply that experience to what we know and how we work. Not yet. Uh, the most exciting and rewarding part about working in clay is that I continue to make, to struggle, to explore, to fail, to find a better way, to get pleasure from what I make, and to see others respond to my work. And that work will grow and improve and will always challenge me to move forward. Not yet. All right, that's it. Uh, Does anybody have any questions? It's a Super Bowl lecture. Uh, Super Bowl lecture? Ah, <laughs> oh, thanks. Is it the Super Bowl weekend? I am not a sports person. Okay. It is the Super Bowl. Yes. Yes. If you were in North Carolina, you might want to head down to the Gulf Coast because that same time period, there's some pottery made by some of the prehistoric cultures there, and that same hand-building shape form. I think you'd find some of that pretty exciting. 
Um, there was a comment in the uh, audience about looking at prehistoric work from Moche. Yes. And also from the Florida Gulf Coast. And the Florida Gulf Coast, yes. Um, I went, when I was in grad school, I had an archaeologist on my thesis committee, so I went to the Natchez Trace with him. Yeah. So I've been to some Indian mounds. But, it's, but the shards are different than the pots, right? Yeah, the shards. Okay, the question was, how, how did I come to atmospheric firing? Hamlin School of Crafts. <laughs> um, I, when I went up to Penland for that first workshop, I took a wood firing class with a potter from um, New Paltz, New York, named Mary Rain, and it blew me away. Um, I, I think it was the community. You can't, you can't fire wood count by yourself. Um, there was also some really well-known potters living in the area that were my mentors there, uh, Will Ruggles and Douglas Rankin, wood fire potters. Um, huh, but why? I, I think it was that first class and I was introduced to that and, and I just really loved, I loved the firing part. I became a really proficient wood fire when I was a student at Penland, but then I, but I don't like chainsaws, so. You know, I was like, okay, Susie, you got to do this by yourself. If you can't manage getting the wood. And also, uh, I hope you guys know who Michael Simon was. He was a potter in Georgia that was a salt fire potter. Um, he came and taught at Penland, and I was in, with him for eight weeks. And so he kind of, and he was using a lot of the same slips, um, and, I, and, and I could see, and salt firing. So I could see that I could get some of the same results without being in the wood kiln. Although I have, I've been firing with some friends this year with their, with their wood kiln. So I don't know. It's a lot of work, the wood firing. But um, I would say probably it was more community than surface, and and the, and, and, and then the people that informed me or that were in the area. There's a lot of wood fires where I live and that still live around there. No, uh, okay, so the question was, what clay do I use and are the recent ones wood fired? So the clay that I use, um, I use, there's two clay places in North Carolina. There's Starworks clay that digs local clays and uh, produces, and I've used their body called Okiwini. And then I also use a, a white stoneware from High Water Clays, which is a big clay manufacturer in Asheville. And I use their clay called Phoenix. Um, the Phoenix is a lighter bodied stoneware, so there's not a lot of iron in it, so it does not go that chocolate brown. I don't really want that chocolate brown. I also don't, I fire in a neutral flame. I'm not firing in reduction. So I'm, so the clay body stays pretty blondish. Except, you know, I want it somewhere between being blonde and kind of flashy. When it's too light, I don't like it. But, um, you know, I, I, my kiln holds about 200 pots. So, um, and I know, and I take notes after every firing, so I know where to place things. And uh, most of the slipped work is on the outside fire face, and the glazed work is on the interior. Um, and then I know where things get more reduction, and so I put pots down there. Um, the, those pots are all salt fired, so um, I'm putting only four pounds of salt in my kiln at the end of the firing. How did I make my transition into single firing? I, um, it, I had been exposed to it as a student, and then I went to Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, and I was Cynthia Brinkle's studio assistant, and we only had a week. And um, she, she said, I want red heat by dawn. <laughs> so, um, so um, I so I I, did, I don't I it was probably from being a pen uh, being a penland and then I did once I learned how to do it I just didn't go back. Um, and for many years, uh, Ken and I didn't have electricity or water in the studio. We didn't have an electric kiln, so it all worked for me. I because I was once firing, um, so I could just continued it in grad school 
and just I feel very comfortable with it. I mean, I think people, so you know, with the with the one siring, there's many different ways to handle it too. Some people apply the glazes and spray them on when they're bone dry, so, but I'm lining everything when it's leather hard, and also my pots are not really thin. So I, they can take that, they just get saturated again when you put the glaze liner. And I'm like, even this winter, I've lost some pots because I forgot and just covered them with plastic and left to go in for the night. And I came out and they had just fallen apart because they were too saturated. But the wood stove was going, so I didn't want them to dry out too much. But, um, you know, one firing can be done in any situation. I have friends that do it in electric kilns. <laughs> You have to tweak your glazes. The question was, do you have to tweak your clay body? Your clay body, all the sulfurs, I mean, everything's burning out, all the, so yeah, if you have a clay body that has a lot of junk in it, it's got to move through the surface and go through the glaze, if it's glaze, or the slip. And that's where a lot of the bubbling comes from. But the slips, I mean, the glazes all have to be adjusted to fit, to shrink with the pieces. And that's usually with bentonite. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about like what's a typical day and a typical week and a typical month like? <laughs> because you have so many different forms uh -huh. with throwing and handling and decorating, and you said you might bake all the plates and then decorate them with something. I'm just curious about your rhythm. Um, well, things have changed for me because I'm. Uh, I'm what's past mid career? I'm not at the end of my career. But uh, I'm older, and I don't have to do the things that I used to do. But in the beginning, I, w I was filling orders for wholesale orders, and so I would have a weekly making list. Um, and uh, I was doing ACC fairs, so I was taking orders from galleries, and they wanted very specific things. And I also was thinking about how I was stacking the kiln, what I needed to fill the kiln, what I needed for variation in the kiln. Uh, and and the, I always started with the harder things first and the easier things at the end as I got closer and closer to the firing. Uh, now I, I can go make whatever I want to make. So um, I, it, it's, it's a new, I, I'm kind of in a new place right now. Those, that last Arrive tray that had the red on it, um, I spent a whole, some, a whole, six months just making those. I mean, I, I was teaching somewhere, I was a sabbatical replacement, so I had the space and the time to do that, but it's just made me think about, I mean, I came back from that and said, I'm never making another mug, but I just made some mugs. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, you know, so it's, a, it's basically, you know, and I think if you kind of back it up when you're in the studio, trying to make a living, you're using that kiln, every little inch of the space in that kiln. And so I was always thinking about how I was, so I made little fillers for around the bowls, little shot glasses, um, salt shakers that would, so that was the gas money that paid for the propane. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, I had it on paper, but I've seen people that just get big blackboards in their studios and just write down what they're doing weekly and, and their deadlines and everything. It, you know, I mean, I think with anybody that's self-employed, you really have to have some, some discipline about uh, how you're doing it. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions, too. I hope all of you guys are coming. Or if you're not coming, stop by and see what we're doing. I think there's a kids there's a kids show here this weekend too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>